Hey, Pastor Josh here. Thanks so much for watching our videos. If you'd like more information about Legacy City Church, you can go to LegacyCityChurch.com. Please don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell below. God bless you. It's a joy to open the Word of God with you today. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 18 in our Bibles. Matthew chapter 18. And we're working through a series I've titled Jesus Worldview. And um, we have been working verse by verse, chapter by chapter through the text. And many of you have been on this journey with us the whole time. And uh, it's been a joy to do so. I try to preach, I do preach every single verse. And the reason I do this is so that we get the entire counsel of God. Um, there are so many hidden gems just sitting there that people miss and they never get because they skip over passages because they're hard or difficult to understand or uh, people just don't like them and so they don't want to talk about them because they're scared it might uh, scare people away from the church. But I just say we walk through every single text and uh, we get the full counsel of God's word and what he's ultimately trying to say to us here on the earth. This is sermon number 71 in the book of Matthew. And the title of the message today, if you're taking notes, is No Sheep Left Behind. No Sheep Left Behind. This series is titled Jesus Worldview. This entire series of the book of Matthew, Jesus Worldview, is we're trying to align our view with his and get his ultimate view on all things regarding life, regarding society, regarding marriage, regarding family, regarding this nation, regarding the way we view the world. I want to know how Jesus sees it in the end. And I want to align myself with him. And so that's what we're ultimately trying to do through the word of God. Heard of a story. Maybe you heard this one too. Two beggars, they're sitting on a park bench in Ireland. One's holding a cross and the other has the star of David. Both are holding hats to collect contributions. And people walk by and many of them there were lifting their noses at the man with the star of David, but stopped to drop money in the hat of the man with the cross. Soon the hat of the man with the cross was completely filled, and the hat of the man with the star of David was completely empty. A priest watches for a while, and then he approaches the men, and he says to the man with the star of David, don't you realize this is Catholic country? You're never going to get any contributions holding a star of David. The man with the star of David turns to the man with the cross and says, Moshi, can you believe this guy is trying to tell us how to run our business? <laughs> Come on. That's so good. I got to live in Israel for a little while and man, taste of it. Soak it all in and man, I just love the humor. I love the life. I love the, um, the shrewdness. Um, of the Jewish people, and uh, it's fun. They call them uh, sabra. Sabra is the word cactus. They uh, are spiky on the outside, but very, very soft on the inside. No sheep left behind, Matthew 18. Have you ever ran uh, one of these obst obstacle courses called the Tough Mudder? The Tough Mudder. If you don't know what the Tough Mudder is or the Spartan Race, maybe you've heard of one of these before. Uh, this is a 10-mile run with 30 obstacles. And uh, me and my buddies just so happened to sign up for the one that was on a ski resort in Big Bear in the mountains. The run was up the ski runs 10 miles. And the obstacle courses were on the side of mountains. Yes, mud, electrical shock, ropes, and walls to climb. It was wild, and it was tough, but we conquered it, my team of guys, and uh, there were many obstacles in our way trying to get us to fall, and we did fall many times, but we didn't just stop. We kept on moving, and it was rough, man. I will never do it again. <laughs> I, I see guys train for the Ironman, and I'm like, why? Why? Uh, I actually, I get it. I understand the competition. Like, it's something deep in me that wants to, but then when I think through the actual process and discipline and time dedicated to get there and actually perform well, I mean, it, it takes a lot. And uh, you're not just stepping up to do it. The reason I bring up this picture of these obstacles is because it kind of reminds me really of life altogether. 
Um, their life is not, uh, it's not a walk in the park. It really is like an uphill climb. And then on the climb, there seems to be obstacles along the way. And it's like another one and another one and another one. And we find ourselves stumbling around and falling. But hopefully if we have a good team around us, uh, we're able to get back up and continue on in the run and finish the race. Life is like this. We have many stumbling blocks in the way. And we have many things trying to stop us and distract us from moving forward in life and in our walks with God. Stumbling blocks trying to attack our marriages, our families, our minds, our hearts, our church, our lives. And we need to know what the stumbling blocks are, what will show up in life. And we need to know and be reminded that God will carry us through. No sheep left behind. We are in Matthew chapter 18. We're going to read through verses 7 to 14 in our Bibles. Can we stand for the reading of God's Word? We always stand for the reading of God's Word to remember whose Word we're reading. Not mine. It's actually His Word. And uh, His words are what I want to hear in the end. Again, I have some, maybe some motivating or encouraging things to say, but I cannot ultimately change your heart or your mind. Only God can do that. He's the one who has the power to do that, and it's found actually in his word. We stand for the reading to remember whose word we are reading. Give honor and praise to him in his word. Verse 7 in Matthew 18, Jesus says, Woe to the world because of its stumbling blocks, for it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come. Nevertheless, woe to that man through whom the stumbling block comes. And if your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, Cut it off and throw it from you. It is better for you to enter life cripple or lame than having two hands or two feet to be cast into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out and throw it from you. For it is better for you to enter life with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into the fiery hell. See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I say to you, there are angels in heaven continually see see the face of my Father who is in heaven, for the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. What do you think? If any man has 100 sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go and stretch, I'm sorry, search for the one that is straying? And if it turns out that he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it than more than the 99 which have not gone astray. In this way, is it not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones perish? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And we pray now and ask by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would supernaturally minister to each of our lives. That you'd speak right into our situation. You open our eyes and our ears to hear from you. That you'd keep us close in your fold. Keep us close, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Last week, we saw the disciples get caught by Jesus arguing about who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom. Do you remember? Uh, They're they're literally arguing about, I'm going to be the best. No, I'm going to be the greatest. No, I'm going to sit on the throne. No, I'm going to be the one with the biggest house up there. And he told them, he says, get, guys, Stop arguing. I know you're, what are you arguing about? Nothing. I know what you're arguing about. You're arguing about who's going to be the greatest. And he said, unless you become like this little child, humble, fully dependent on God, you will never even get into heaven. Stop assuming that you're even getting in because you guys are acting like you're not. Jesus also warned it would be better to have a milestone I'm sorry, a millstone, not milestone, a millstone tied around your neck and thrown into the deep depths of the sea, into the ocean, and then it caused one of these little ones or his children or his people to stumble. And that's where our story picks up. The Lord is in the middle of making this point. Look at verse 7 once again. Woe to the world because of its stumbling blocks. For it is inevitable that stumbling blocks will come. Nevertheless, woe to that man through whom the stumbling blocks come. Jesus uses the word woe. 
And this is not like, whoa, man, crazy. This is like, woe to you. Warning. Alarms going off. A great warning. He says, woe to the world because of their stumbling blocks, their roadblocks, their spike strips, the sinful people and things they put into our paths to pull us away from the Lord or slow us down in our walks with the Lord. Jesus not only warns his own disciples not to cause another believer to stumble by acting sinfully, but he warns the world, the non-believer. He said, be careful. Cause one of my little ones to stumble. He says, you wolves, stay away because the shepherd is coming. And that shepherd will shoot them dead. Surprisingly, it was Peter who was actually the one causing Jesus to stumble just a couple chapters ago. Do you remember? Matthew 16, 23. But Jesus turned to Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. Watch this. You are a stumbling block to me. Jesus called Peter a stumbling block. The stumbling block is our text right now. And he says, because Peter, you don't have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Block number one, block number one if you're taking notes, stumbling block number one is other Christians. Other Christians. We as believers are not to be causing other believers to stumble by our bad example. There may be someone looking up to us. Someone who's trying to follow after you. Somebody who thinks you're a great godly Christian. So use discretion. Do you know there is always someone looking up to you? Always. You don't know it, but there is someone watching you. I don't know who it is. I don't know if it's at a regular place that you go to often. I don't know if it's a family member or a friend. I don't know if it's in the workplace. I don't know who it is, but there is somebody always looking up to you. Maybe in the church. You don't want your actions to be the ones that causes believers to fall away from the Lord. Wouldn't that be the saddest thing ever? My actions, because of my bad example, would actually cause someone to stumble so much that they would fall away from the faith for a little while and have to go through treacherous desert lands and valleys before they actually come back to the faith. God forbid. Have I done this? I'm sure I have. In 20 years of being in the church and being a leader in the church and teaching a lot of people, I'm sure I've failed a lot of people. It's sad when someone becomes a Christian, then they get close to other believers and find out who they really are. (laughs) They snub that girl or gossip about that person or sleep with that person and bail or do something sketch in business. I'll never forget one of my mentors a long time ago said, I will never, he's a mentor, he was a Christian, and he was a businessman. He said, I will never do business with Christians. Because he got burned in the past. And I was like, what? Of all people, you would think this is the one that you would want to do business with. It's hard to move beyond those things when another Christian hurts you. It's not impossible, church. That's the hope. But it's not easy. It comes through forgiveness and grace and saying, I'm sorry. It's not easy, but redemption is there. It's available, and it does happen often. But it's difficult, huh? The church is difficult. Man, we could keep the church totally packed out and growing if Christians would stop scaring people off, right? It's a joke. Come on. You can lighten up. You've heard it before. If you ever find a perfect church, don't join it because you'll ruin it, right? There's no such thing as a perfect church. People show up at Legacy. Man, I love this church. The best church ever. I'm like, don't worry. (laughs) Give us six months to a year. We will fail you. We're broken people seeking the Almighty as best we can. That's just all. That's just the truth. I'm going to stand up here and act like we're perfect because nobody is. We all need Jesus. 
We are not to cause other Christians to stumble as much as it is possible. And if we do, go make it right. Go say you're sorry. Jesus also warns the world from causing his own people to stumble. He literally says, woe to you, world. We are to be in the world, church, but we are not to be what? Of the world. That's right. John 17, 14, I have given them your word, Jesus prayed. And the world has hated them because they are not of the world. Just as I am not of the world, Jesus says. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, no, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. It's important that every believer is living in this real world and not isolating ourselves away from it. So we can shine the light into the darkness, okay? Do not, please, I repeat, do not become a mad scientist and lock yourself in your cave or in your garage and never come out for six months. Don't do that. You think you're perfectly fine. But when people see you after six months, they say, what in the world happened to you? If you isolate, you'll go mad. You'll go crazy. It is not good that man should be alone. We need one another. Well, I don't like people. That's okay. Just like one or two. Find a couple people you can be built up by and encouraged on a regular basis. You need sounding boards around you. If you are left alone in your own thoughts by yourself alone for a long time, you'll find yourself in big trouble. It happens to us all. Have you ever seen that show, Alone? It's a great show. The challenge is they have 10 contestants, I believe, and they send them off into this island up into Alaska out in the middle of nowhere, Canada, and they drop them off and leave them there literally alone, no camera crew, no one out there to see who can survive alone the longest, and whoever does wins the big money prize. And you see these people, man, it's literally at about the 30-day mark, you see them start to crack. Because they've literally just been alone with the trees, with the animals, with the darkness, and with themselves. And you literally watch them as they are there in their tents, the little you know, shelter they've built. They will start to confess I mean, it's looking from a pastor's perspective. I'm just watching them. They'll start to confess and cry about all kinds of things. It's amazing to watch the emotional things happening and the spiritual things happening to them, let alone the physical. They have to figure out how to find food and survive on their own. But it's interesting how the emotional, the mental is what gets at them. So if things aren't good back at home, They can't survive. They can't make it. But isn't this us all? We need things good at home. We need not to isolate ourselves away from everyone we have problems with. We need to make things right. We're to be peacemakers, bridge builders. It's important that, again, every believer is living in this real world, not isolating ourselves away from it so we can shine the light into the darkness. We are to be in the world on a mission. Let God use you to shine right where you're at. How? By being set apart, knowing your boundaries, speaking up for truth, loving people at a high level, showing grace like God does. Move in humility. Don't be a stick in the mud, but don't partake in sin. We are different. We are God's people. We are to be in the world, but not of it. And people should be able to tell the difference between you and the world. There should be a huge difference. And man, I've been hanging out with you for a little while, and I know there's something different about you. If they can't see that, there's a problem. If you were placed on a witness stand, would there be enough evidence in your life to convict you of being a Christian? 
Can they go down the path and convict you? You are, this is definitely a Christian. I also want to encourage each of you and every one of us to grow in such maturity and in Christ that no matter what any believer does that may tempt us to stumble or what any, I should say, non-believer does that would tempt us to stumble, that we wouldn't. We would grow to a place in grace where we can realize these are just people, just women, just men, and they need Jesus just like I do, but not to be looking down on every single other person in the world or in the church that causes you to stumble or fail. We go to a place of maturity, we realize we're all just broken. And I'm not surprised that someone else broke and hurt me. It's going to happen. But we grow to a place of maturity over time. And we choose to love them like Jesus does us. And we all need Christ the same now, don't we? We all need the same dose. No one needs him more than another. So we need not look down on one another. Or be stumbled by another. Romans 3 9, well then, should we conclude that no Jews, that we Jews are better than others? No, Paul argues, not at all. For we have already shown that all people, whether Jews or Gentiles, are all under the power of sin. The whole world. Proverbs 20, verse 9 says, Who can say, I have kept my heart pure? I am cleansed from my sin. Who can say this? I have kept my heart pure. Only those who place their trust and faith in the Lord Jesus every single day can say, I am cleansed from my sin. Walking with him. Lord, wash me. Cleanse me. Save me. Forgive me. We need it every single day. Preaching the gospel to ourselves every single day. Reminding ourselves of who we are every single day in him. We are in the world and we are tempted by worldly people. And Jesus is pretty clear. Woe to the world because of its stumbling blocks. This is block number two, if you're taking notes. The world. Stumbling block number two is the world. First, it can be Christian. Second block is the world. He says stumbling blocks will come in your life. Temptations will come, but woe to the person who brings them your way to cause you to fall. Jesus is speaking specifically towards non-believers in verse 7, and we as believers need to be wise in who we spend a lot of time with in the world. Because sometimes we think we are influencing them, but before you know it, we are being influenced. Many times we think we can pull them up is that illustration of sitting on a stool and you think you can pull somebody up. Sometimes you can, but oftentimes it's way easier for them to pull you down. So we must be on guard. Philippians 2.15, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Literally, let me place you as a light in the middle of this crooked, perverse, and twisted generation. And man, that is exactly what's going on in this world. In our city, everything is backwards and upside down. What is right is wrong, and what is wrong is right. It is crazy. Whereas they say we are progressive. Progressing in what? Hating and hurting each other more? Yeah, we're nailing that so good. Romans 12, 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Through this, the word of God, by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. 1 John 2, 15 says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, The pride of life or the pride in possessions is not from the Father, but it is from the world. The world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Whoever does the will of God abides forever. I want you to see this dichotomy. God both hates the things of the world and the ways of the world, yet what? 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. We are to be in the world, but not of the world. We are to be loving the people in the world, serving the people in the world, but we are not to be walking in the ways of the world. We are swimming opposite direction of the stream. The world is going the other way. The narrow is wide and many find it. The road is wide and many find it. But the way to God is narrow and few find it. Allow me to take it one step further. A person who is causing you to stumble, a non-believer, could be in great danger. The Lord is not happy with them and will judge them greatly for it. It would be better for you to distance yourself from them than to find themselves in greater judgment for causing one of God's people to stumble more. If you can't help falling into sin with specific non-believers, maybe you aren't being helpful to them or yourself. Be careful. You don't want to get them into more trouble with God. Remember, it's like Jonah with all the non-believing uh, sailors on the boat. And they're like, dude, this storm is going off right now. What's going on? There's something wrong. We're all going to die. We're all going to drown. And then Jonah just confesses. He's like, it's me. I'm a prophet of God, and I'm supposed to be going to Nineveh, and I don't want to go there. And so I was hoping to get on this cruise and go to Spain, and it didn't work out. And so that's why we're all in trouble. What? You caused this to come on us. We're all going to drown out here. He says, I know, but look, I'll, I'll give you a tip. <laughs> a quick tip. <laughs> I want you to grab me by my legs and my arms. And a one, and a two, and a three. Throw me overboard, and this whole thing will stop. The text literally says... You can go read it again, Book of Jonah. As when they threw him overboard, when he hit the water, the whale comes up and swallows him, and the whole thing stops. This storm stops when the believer is obedient to God. Woe to the one who causes his people to stumble. You don't want to get in trouble with God. Who wants to go talk to him? Let me ask you, do you have people in your life who are stumbling blocks, always trying to pull you away from the world? Be careful, because one day they might pull you far enough to stumble and fall greatly. You might not come back for a while. And instead of unfriending them, Love them from a distance. You set boundaries when you hang out. Keep shining in their life. Just don't let them stumble you. You be mature. You have places to go. You're on your way to heaven. Bring as many people as you, with you as you can. Be set apart and see who will jump on the train with you. You be different. It's like uh, the old buddies from high school. I remember when I was still living back in Riverside. Like, Come on, dude. All the guys were going to the bar. We're going to get smashed. We're going to get hammered tonight. Come on, let's go. I'd be like, no, nah, dude. <laughs> I'm a grown man. This is what you did in high school. Like, what? Are you guys still? I'll go get lunch with you anytime. You want to sit down and have some time together and goof off? You want to go jump off a cliff? You want to go surf some waves? I'm game. But I'm not going to start ruining my life to appease you, my man. You can hang with me anytime you want, but I'm not hanging with you. That's the line. That's the boundary. And you know who they call when somebody dies of cancer? They don't call their drunk friends. Hey, Josh, I know, I know you're a praying man. Uh, would you say a prayer for me? Yeah, of course. You got it. Be careful. Keep shining your light. You're on your way. You got stuff to do. We don't have time to be confused, and locked up in patterns that just cause us into a spin that don't make sense. We question life and what we're doing and where we are. The world can be a stumbling block. Jesus is trying to explain to us. 
The Lord continues, look at verse 8. If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, there's the word again. Would you say stumble with me? Stumble. One more time. Stumble. If your hand or what? Foot causes you to stumble. Interesting. Cut it off and throw it from you. What a visual, man. Just cut the leg off and then just throw it. <laughs> this is wild. Cut it off and just throw it. It is better for you to enter life cripple or lame than having two hands or two feet and be cast into eternal fire. Did you see that? A place of eternal fire. I didn't say that. That's Jesus' words. The Lord says we as believers aren't to cause our brother or sister to stumble. Woe to the world who causes the believer to stumble. And we are not to cause ourselves to stumble. He says if your hand or your foot are causing you to live in a sinful lifestyle, cut it off. It's better to enter heaven with only one hand than to never make it at all because your other hand was holding on to hell. Holding on to hell. He said cut it off and throw it. Block number three, if you're taking notes, block number three, stumbling block number three, is yourself. It's me. I'll never forget the biggest, uh, John Piper said, the biggest enemy in this war is me. Me. My heart is default set to sin. And every day I got to turn that dial back to Jesus. Got to turn it back every single day. It's like the spa. Remember, you get in the spa and you turn on the dial. You get to sit in that thing for 45 minutes. Like, man, it's so nice. It's freezing outside. All of a sudden, it turns off. You're like, who's going to be the one to get out and turn that thing back on? The dial is just ticking back in the opposite direction, back to sin, and I feel it every single day. I'm shocked sometimes. I've been walking with the Lord for over 20 years. And I cannot believe how many times the dial of my heart is set back to sin and I want to be sinful. I want to be hurtful. I want to be mad. I want to be angry. I can't believe it. It makes me throw myself on the Lord Jesus and say, who will save me from this body of sin and death? It's the Lord Jesus. I'm turning that dial back to him. Don't trust yourself. I don't trust myself to make the right decisions because I know my heart. The Bible says our heart is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? I know myself. And I will tell you that if you talked to me when I was 20 years old and said, who are you going to be when you're getting close to 40 years old? I'd say, oh man, I'm going to be super Christian. You watch. You'd be like, I'm almost, almost no problems in my life. Just go talk to my wife. <laughs> so I know myself, I must take steps to guard against my tendencies. Accountability, setting boundaries in my own life, saying I'm not gonna go there, I'm not gonna do this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna set my own boundaries, I'm gonna set my own standards for my own life. Never gonna push that on another person, that's for me, not for them, that's for me, I know myself. 1 Timothy 4, 6, the Apostle Paul told Timothy, keep a close watch on yourself and your teaching. Persist in this, for by doing so, you will save both yourself and your hearers. You've got to keep watch on yourself. Well, I'm good at keeping watch on everybody else. Keep watch on yourself. Galatians 5.24, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Literally crucified ourselves spiritually, the sin in our bodies that so pulls us away from God. Therefore, 2 Corinthians 5.17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, the new has come. And the new has come to this place now. It is in you. It is Working in you now, the Holy Spirit is dwelling in you. And so, in the name of Jesus, walk in newness of life. Keep walking in newness of life one day at a time. What if I get to an obstacle and I stumble or fall? Oh, well. Get up, dust off your knees, 
call upon the Lord to save you again and get walking forward. The best thing the enemy could ever do is to get you to stay away from God for 10 days. Then it turns into a month. And then it turns into three months. And then it's a year. And you wonder, I'm not even in church anymore. Man, I used to worship the Lord. I'm so far from the Lord. What has happened to me? The best thing you could ever do after you've fallen is to turn back to the Lord with all of your heart, with everything you have. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away. Please don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. Please restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Renew a right, dedicated, devoted spirit in me. Renew that spirit. Make it new. Matthew Henry said, every willful sinner ought to be told that he is a dead man. Dead men walking. I need the Spirit of God to fill me every single, the resurrection power of God to fill me every single day. I know you can't do it. Me either. We have to call upon the Lord. Have you ever seen gangrene? The disease? Gangrene. I was going to put a picture on the screen, but I'm not going to do it to you. <laughs> on a foot or a leg? From lack of circulation, the foot, toes, or legs turn like black leather. Looks like charcoal almost. Looks like death. And listen, if your leg gets gangrene, it's better you remove the foot or the leg than die. You got to cut it off. It's a no-brainer in those situations, but for some reason when it comes to sin, which is deadly, we have no problem keeping the disease. It's because we have forgotten how deadly sin really is. And it's not until you get stung really badly by it, and then you're like, oh man, I remember how bad this really is. The great John Owen coined this phrase, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. You decide. Proverbs 14, 12, the great Solomon said, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. Be careful. I know what's right. Be careful. Sin will take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. It convinces you. It lures me in. It tickles the ears. It slowly works us in. It is the frog boiling in the pots. It is slowly turning up the heat. You don't even realize it until you're dead. And I've seen this happen with so many pastors, and it is so sad. Galatians 6, 7 says, Do not be deceived. God is not to be mocked. Whatever a man sows, he will reap in return. The one who sows to please the flesh, from the flesh he will reap destruction. But the one who sows to please the Spirit, the Spirit will reap eternal life. The great Augustine said, each man's sin is the instrument of his punishment, and his iniquity is turned into his torment. Oftentimes, the things that torment us and the things that punish us in life are the things that we have created. The small deposits, the little baby seeds that we plant along the way, and we don't even realize that it is growing up in us all kinds of weeds everywhere. And before you know it, it's for some reason attacking our marriage, and then it's, a, it's attacking our business, and then it's attacking the way I treat other people. And my mind is clouded, and I feel confused and depressed, and I'm far. I don't know what's wrong with me. They even sprinkling little seeds of sin everywhere along the way. But I didn't do any big ones. I know. It's the little ones. John Bunyan said, one leak will sink a ship. One sin will destroy a sinner. One leak. That's all it takes. Isn't that crazy? You get one nail in your tire, you're pulling over. It's all it takes. But I know, like you, we are convinced many times because God is gracious that the sin will not catch up to us. 
because we got away with it so many times. So we think that because God is gracious and he has forgiven me, I think I'm good and I move on and we fall back into it. And then we don't realize one day he pulls the rug out from under us and says, I tried to tell you. I tried to warn you. Church, family, I love you. I tell you these things because I love you and because I messed up a lot of life. And I would rather save you from the torment of sin, not tell you, than not tell you and find yourself in hell. Hell on earth, hell on eternity, God forbid. Jesus literally uses this language speaking to his own disciples. He says, cut off the hand, cut off the foot. Be careful. Don't let your hands bury you. Don't let your feet pull you away from the Savior. It's better to cut them off. I pray often, Lord, handcuff me to you. Don't let me get far. You just keep me handcuffed next to you, Lord. Throw away the key. I don't care if I need a jerk every once in a while. Just literally just pull me along. Sometimes I'm laying on the ground. I don't want to go, just drag me. Just drag me. I want to be with you. I don't want to be by myself. As the song goes, oh, to grace, how great a debtor. He writes, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Whatever may be causing you to fall into sin over and over again, I'd encourage you in the name of the Lord Jesus, just cut it off. It's dead weight. It's hurting you. You may not be able to see it. You may not be able to feel it today. Just cut it off. Only you know how to cut that thing off. It's a person, it's a place or a thing. God is not calling you to actually cut your hand or foot off. Please no one do that, okay? He's calling you for greater that you could cut that sin off of your life before it destroys your life, your marriage, your family, your work, most important, your relationship with the Lord Jesus. Okay? Let's take it a step further. What do you say? Are you okay? Strap on your seatbelt. It gets better, I promise. Verse 9, and if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out, throw it out from you. Literally just tear the thing out. Lord, shouldn't we do like scalpel and surgery? He says, no, just tear it out. It's better for you to enter life with one eye than having two eyes and be cast into the fiery hell. Jesus uses the word hell. Why are we scared to say the word hell in church? Hell, 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 hell. Jesus says it. It's his word. He made it. The Bible actually says that hell was made for the devil and his fallen angels, not for humans. And it's sad that people end up there because they basically shout to God, I don't want you. I don't acknowledge a creator. I don't want you. I don't want to have anything to do with you. Jesus speaks about the eye. The eye is the window to the soul. Be careful what you allow into your soul. Don't let your eyes stumble you. It is where lust, greed, envy, bitterness, and anger all begin. Right here. And these little things right here. Our eyes are like a camera, huh? Capturing everything it sees and chooses to focus on. Isn't that interesting? Be careful to focus on sinful things because it will fill your memory card full of sin and you will wonder why you're sick. Also, be careful how you look through the lens because a bad outlook on life, thinking the worst about people and always seeing the worst in people is also death to us. What you soak in with your eyes and what you choose to focus on becomes your thoughts. And if sinful patterns start, a root will take place in your heart and all of a sudden bad fruit will start to sprout. That's how it works. It starts in these babies right here. Who would know that these little things could cause so much trouble? These things are connected to the heart, aren't they? Connected to the mind. The ears and the eyes. We have to be careful. Philippians 4.8. Finally, brothers and sisters, please, whatever is true, 
whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Set your mind on these things. If you are walking in the Spirit, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. It sounds like this is a big sermon about saying no, 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 no. It's not. It's more of a sermon about saying yes a thousand times to God and you will magically say no to all these other things. You don't need to focus on saying no to all this stuff. Please just walk with the Lord daily. As you walk in the Spirit, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Whatever these things are, Philippians 4a, get your mind on those things. Get your eyes on those things and watch how the sin just starts to fade away. I want to encourage some of you today because some of you are thinking, man, I have planted a lot of bad seed in the past. I want you to know that God is so gracious that all of that seed will not come up. You look at the danger, look at David, take a man's wife and kill him, and why is David still king? What is Moses doing standing up on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus? He gets to be one of the guys after he blew it and misrepresented God and didn't get to enter the promised land. What I have seen is that God seems to be a God of great grace. And some of you are like, man, I've already buried my life. It's over. I'm never getting out. You may be six feet under, but you need to know you serve a God who resurrects. He pulls us out. He can restore the locusts. He can restore a hundredfold that the locusts have eaten away in a couple days. He can do that. I've had a lot of locusts come through my life, you say. I know. Herds. Flying through, eating up everything, destroying everything. And God says, you know what? I'm going to hit the start button and we're going to grow exponentially. And you get to start planting all kinds of beautiful seed in your life. And all of a sudden you reap the blessings and you don't know why. Because you burned up so much of the past, you know you don't deserve it. And the grace of God just keeps pouring on you. And you're in awe. Why is God doing this for me? Get your eyes and mind on things that give you life, not steal from you. Vance Havner said, sin is a spiritual cancer, and the man who tries to live with it will die of it. Matthew Henry says, it's no mystery that our sorrows are multiplied when our sins are. Don't play with sin. Cut it off, or it will kill you. Look at verse 10 and 11. The story gets better. We're going to close here. See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I say to you that their angels in heaven continually see the face of my Father who is in heaven, for the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. Jesus is saying, do not despise any believer. Instead, build them up and encourage them. Don't look down on another believer. This is another way we cause each other to stumble or fall. Jesus makes the case that Every believer, or these little ones, watch this, all have angels who stand before the Father in heaven and go to minister and help believers when they are in need. And so if God is willing to send angels to help every and any believer on earth, who are we to look down on them? They have angels that will show up for them. That dude? Yeah, even him. God will send angels for him. Really? I wouldn't send angels for him. I know. We don't like certain people, but God does. If they're his kids, he's going to take care of them. Verse 11, for Jesus came to save the lost. That person you may be despising. Then the Lord goes on to show how far he is willing to go to save his people. Some of the sheep that maybe you don't like or maybe despise, look at he is the savior of the lost. Verse 12, 13, 14, take a look. 
What do you think? If a man has 100 sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go and search for the one that is, that is straying? And if it turns out that he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the 99 which have gone astray. In this way, it is, is it not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones perish? It's not the will. Jesus gives us a parable to illustrate this point. He says, if the body of Christ, watch this, is a picture of 100 sheep, the body of Christ, picture of 100 sheep, it's not a picture of one church, it's all churches, not one believer, all believers, all denominations, 100 sheep whom the good shepherd oversees, right? If one of those sheep wanders away and stumbles away and falls away and has gone astray, the good shepherd will leave the 99 up on the mountain and go searching for that one sheep who is wandering in the valleys. Point number four, and finally, no sheep left behind. John 10, 16, I have other sheep, Jesus said, that are not of this fold. Really? Really? I must bring them in as well, he said, and they will listen to my voice. Then there will be one flock and one shepherd. One flock, one shepherd. John 10, 14, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I will give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Nobody. My people, my sheep, my flock, I will take care of them. None of them are getting away. I will protect them. Jesus, church, listen, will find his lost sheep. And he is willing to leave the 99 where they are right there on the mountain and go to find this one because he loves that one just as much as he loves the 99. He loves us all the same. And he will find his sheep And after searching and pursuing that sheep, once he finds it, he will rejoice greatly over it. Jesus says in the parable, he will rejoice more than the 99 who have not gone astray. What does that mean? It's simple. When you lose something very valuable, let's say a diamond ring, you don't rejoice that you haven't lost all your other rings or jewelry. You start searching and searching and searching, and once you find the diamond ring you lost, you rejoice that much more over what you had lost. As a parent, have you ever lost your child in the supermarket or Disneyland? Oh, Lord. I mean, praise God, we have not yet. Um, But you can can imagine, uh, if you lost a child, even if you got 10... And you lost one, and now you got nine left over. You're like, I just need to find that one. And you're running frantically through Disneyland. You're on the loudspeaker. Hello, hello, does anybody know where a child is? Sir, stop that. Give me that. You're you're doing everything that you can. And once you find your child, you are overjoyed, thankful that you have your child back. It shows a heightened concern for that which is lost. Verse 11 again, for the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. Jesus has a focus on his lost sheep. And we need to as well, church. Pray for those who have gone astray and for those who God is saving, is in the process of saving. Matthew 9, 11, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. I want the lost. My focus is on the lost. It's easy to focus on healthy Christians, huh? The 99. It's hard to focus on that sheep that keeps wandering. You just want to pull off the rod and just crack them, you know? Would you just please stop that? It's easy to focus on the church, the 99 who are saved. It's hard to focus on those who are not yet saved, but being saved. The non-believer, the future believer, the lost. 
2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises. Some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. John 3, 16 and 17, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that everyone who believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world no but to save the world through him no one wants the shepherd to leave the 99 to go look for that one sheep that's wandering all the time until that one sheep is us until it's me I hope they would send the shepherd out to come find me if I was wandering Please, Lord, don't leave me out in the valley. Don't leave me out in the cold. Where am I going to find waters? Where am I going to find food? Psalm 119, 176. You've never heard this one before. It's good. I have strayed like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I have not forgotten your commandments. Like Nebuchadnezzar in the field, broken and struck down, grown nails and feathers like a bird, humbled a king. He cries out to God in mercy, and God says, you're one of my sheep. You're just lost for a little while. Come on back. We would have all condemned Nebuchadnezzar. Church, even if you've fallen away from God, God will leave his post, and he will find you, and he will bring you back in. He's not going to leave you out in the cold to starve and die Though you ran from him, he will run to you. God would say to you, though you ran from me, I will run to you. Isn't that awesome? He has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. What an awesome God we serve, huh? He keeps his sheep to the very end. I don't know if you're wandering today or what you're up to, but God's found you. He brought you here today. He's speaking to you. He's building you up. He's encouraging you. Don't worry. We all get away from the flock from time to time. And he has to throw that staff out and ring us back in, and that's okay. But we're thankful we have a good shepherd who keeps us. I can't keep myself. I need God to keep me, and so I throw myself on him every single day. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, and we pray now by the power of your Holy Spirit. Oh, God, would you raise us to life resurrect us in this place lord we're thankful that we are part of your flock and even if we somehow get stumbled away from the pack and down into a dark valley there's wolves out to get us lord you will find us you will keep us you will sustain us you will nourish us you will make sure we are taken care of you will not let us starve you will not let us be eaten lord you will allow us to come back into the fold you're a gracious king you're an awesome god and I pray for everyone here today, Lord, wherever each, each one is at, your people. I pray that you'd bring them into the fold now. That, Lord, you've ran to them. You found them. And you bring them in close. Lord, we ask for forgiveness. We ask for grace once again in our lives. We need your message. We need your gospel. We need your truth. You are the good shepherd. We will follow you all the days of our lives. And we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.